Every year at the Relics conference, we do a profile. Uh, in the past, we have profiled uh, Superfly, Bower Presents, and Portugal Demand. And today, we turn our eyes to Wasserman Music, which uh, I believe technically on April 21st will celebrate two years of existence, though for a period of time it was the worst kept secret in music, but that's okay. Everyone that, that's accurate on the dates. <laughs> Um, but before I get into Wasserman music, I think it's important to uh, talk a little bit about the company they are part of, which is Wasserman, and that's part of what kind of makes their, uh, makes it so unique. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of Wasserman. Uh, bear with me, because I think it's important to just understand the expansiveness that is Wasserman. Founded in 2002 by Casey Wasserman, headquartered in Los Angeles, Wasserman has a global presence of more than 1,500 employees across six continents and 23 com countries operating more than 40 cities worldwide, including London, New York, Toronto, Raleigh, The Hague, Nashville, and Shanghai. So there's three pillars that make up Wasserman, um, and that's sports, brands, and music. For sports, these are the different parts of sports. Action sports and Olympic, Paralympics, baseball, basketball, boxing, global football, golf, hockey, the NFL, post-career, that's like people like Mike Tirico and Bob Costas, Rugby, for brands of property, they have their core business, then they have laundry service, cycle, the collective, Wasserman Next Gen, Wasserman Digital Design, and technology. But today, like I said, we're here about music. So, um, you know, I think what's interesting about Wasserman, as you'll learn, is that it's not your typical agency, right? And that how they do business, their philosophies, and the people within it don't necessarily come from a core background of just being agents. So I think the folks up here are reflective of the ethos of Wasserman Music. So I think it'd be helpful to just go down the line and talk a little bit about how you got to be an agent, agent at Wasserman Music because all your paths are, are quite different. That could take an hour to itself. But we'll uh, make it brief. You're capped <laughs> at 45 seconds. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Um, my name's Lee Anderson. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I am an agent and um, part of the executive team that manages the business at Wasserman. Uh, I got my start as an independent promoter, did a lot of actually jam shows, um, and joined a company called AM Only, which was um, an electronic agency in 2006. That got acquired uh, by Paradigm, and I'm going to forget what year, and then via Paradigm ended up um, moving into Wasserman. I'm Chapel McAllister. I had a business development for Wasserman Music in Nashville. Um, I started my career on a brand agency with a brand agency that was actually a competitor to Wasserman. Um, and I, I primarily toured. Um, back when tour sponsorships were a big thing, I would go out on the road and execute those tour sponsorships. Um, then I moved to artist management, and then uh, I eventually moved to Paradigm, which was acquired by Wasserman. Hey everybody, Molly Balin. I'll start by saying I'm not an agent. Um, I work on the Wasserman side of the house, so work very closely with all these guys, but work on sort of the WAS proper, as we, as we call it, the OG Wasserman side of the house. Um, I started my career at Live Nation, based in the Bay Area, made my way to New York, did a quick stint at MSG, and then was brought over to Wasserman to really lead music and build the music vertical as Josh. So, adequately said, uh, we were a sports agency um, at first and have evolved more into the music space um, from a brand and property side first and then, of course, now with uh, representing artists. I'm Jonathan Levine, part of the music group here and based in Nashville. Um, my, I've been in Nashville for 11 years this month and came from our Monterey office where I spent 17 years prior to that with Monterey Peninsula Artists. We were part of the Foundation when Paradigm acquired our company to become its music division and Lee and I, which I'm sure we'll get into maybe at some point, we're part of the, uh, the group with Jackie and uh, uh, a select group who we didn't sign up for it but ended up having to navigate the impossible to first imagine and then see through this idea of Wasserman music. And we'll be two this week as Josh said. Um, as a parent of four and one who delivered three of my four kids myself at home hands-on. The idea of terrible twos has been, that's, I don't know what that is. We've always approached it as the terrific twos, so we're 
about to become more terrific than we have in the first two years, and we're just getting started. So it's a privilege to be here. We appreciate being asked, and let's roll. Uh, so Casey, the, the founder, Casey Wasserman, has said that he had coffee with Paradigm's founder and CEO, Stan Gores, one, quote, once a week for multiple years trying to buy the business. So the decision to buy Paradigm wasn't necessarily a rash one, and it was an opportunistic one given the state of the world. But Jonathan, as you sort of alluded to, and as we've talked about, I'm wondering if you and Lee can kind of give us some of that inside perspective of what that process was like to, as you said, do the impossible, or what felt like the impossible at the time, to bring Paradigm into uh, the Wasserman family and what those you know, six months or a year was like before you were able to kind of actually uh, feel like it, it might be something that you could actually fully green light and say this is, this is going to happen. Well, I, I think for everybody, not just what we went through, but everybody, if you're in this room and you work in this, uh, I guess the other sport that Wasserman is involved in is this full, full contact sport, which is called the music business. But for those of us who have been in the live touring business and started our careers and operate in that world, um, goes without saying, our world just came grinding to a halt on March 12th. Um, and on March 19th, it was very clear that, that there was trouble in River City, and on March 20th, we had to uh, deal with some absolutely impossible situations that none of us signed up for. And it was that day, that weekend, and the days that followed, we weren't sure what our future was going to be from a company standpoint, and we knew that um, after the round of layoffs that we were forced to deal with, that there was 134 people. Um, and the analogy that I've used is that we were floating on wreckage in the North Atlantic, and there was a handful of lifeboats that may have been there to save a handful of people. But we made a commitment that weekend and in all the months going forward to whatever we did was going to save 134 people come hell or high water. And that was, that was the mission. And then it was, where, where, where might we go? And by the end of March, it was very clear that our future as a music division, which we were not in control of, was heading to a couple different ports. And it gave us an opportunity with this new thing called Zoom, where we were doing two a day at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., a group of six of us, which ended up being 15 months of this in addition to try and keep our own heads straight, to keep our crew and our team straight and our artists and our managers uh, navigating something that nobody ever again had dealt with or could have experienced. And in that window, we were moving tours in March to April and May thinking it was going to be a bad month or two. But um, <clears throat> when, the, when the idea came up with Casey, it was April 3rd, 2020, that we did that initial Zoom with him. And there had been a lot of talk with Wasserman and, and Paradigm pre-pandemic. We just didn't know what it was. And any time we tried to get any kind of insight on that, it was, it was opaque at best. Um, so from that first Zoom with Casey on April 3rd, which we didn't know if it would last five minutes, ten minutes, uh, if you knew anything about us. I think it was like four hours. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was over two and a half hours. And we had said to him that our vision... If we, if we are being forced to reimagine what life in the agency business looks like on the other side, and again, nobody could have known where the other side was or what it was going to do and the kind of degree of change it was going to um, inflict upon humanity, let alone our business and for us, our company. But from that standpoint, um, we, knew, we, we knew this. What we, knew, we knew a lot that we didn't know, but we definitely knew that we didn't want to be paradigm with a different label. We didn't want to end up in the 80-year-old model of the vertically integrated Hollywood talent agency, which is what all the majors, including Paradigm, are based on. Not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent. Just for us, we didn't want to end up in that same place. That felt like a, a very dated place to be. And as changes are happening as that we all participate in that have nothing to do with music, just the change in culture, the change in content, the ability of the streaming renaissance that we're in, et cetera, that the, that the major full-service, vertically integrated Hollywood talent agency, uh, which has largely been based on television packaging and, and revenues that come from syndication and whatnot, that as that was going to end in June of 2021 with the settlement of the WGA strike, that the landscape from a major agency standpoint was going to look a lot different. Would it go away? Absolutely not. Um, but it was going to change. And so for us, we, we thought that the 
that the, that the future of the agency business would look at some nexus of sports, music, and branding. And we were music, Wasserman was sports and branding, and when we had that first conversation with Casey on April 3rd, um, we said with great respect to his grandfather who basically came up with that model 80 or 6, 1940, so 80-some years ago, um, uh, that that's not where we wanted to live if there was a conversation to have. And to our uh, delight, he said, that's the last thing I want to do, and he gave us some insight as to what the conversations had been leading up to that Zoom we had, and that's why it lasted two and a half hours. He knew more about us than we did in a lot of ways, about our music division. We weren't names and artists and numbers on a spreadsheet to him. And, and he knew, most importantly, our, our, not just our reputation, but our commitment to artist development, our approach to artist representation, um, and it's what allowed the whole conversation to proceed for the months that it did. Yeah, and I think... You know, we kind of had two basic kind of North Stars as pillars for what we wanted to be. Um, and we had a, a long time to really flesh those things out. But it was sort of, we want to create a company that's the best company to work at the business, right? Which involved transparency, progressive values, right? People want to help one another. Um, and we wanted to be the best in artist representation, right? And, and um you know, the, the major agency model of the time felt a little antiquated. Um, I think, you know, we want to be able to service our clients that have a desire to, to act and be in film and television, which I think we do at a very high level. Um, but we didn't want to convince everyone that they should be an actor, right? Um, and I think you were seeing a lot of those agencies get weakened with the WGA agreement and, you know, as you've seen things like Range Media come up and all these high-level talent agents that were leaving, it didn't seem as important. And what did seem important was sort of how you impact culture, what some of those visibility opportunities are, be it the Super Bowl or NBA All-Star Weekend, um, the ability to really help managers and artists understand who their audience is from an R&I standpoint and brand and endorsement deals. Um, and Wasserman kind of checked every single box um, and worked with us to surround us and help us realize what we wanted the music division to look like. Um, and uh, we, we knew very quickly, as Jonathan said, that that, um, that would be the place. I don't think we thought it would take as long as it took to get it done, but, but yeah. And what we also were, one thing that we felt real clear on too is, is with the unknown of how long this, shutdown was going to last, what we didn't want to do is find ourselves having arrived to that moment and then having to figure out who we were, what we were, what we were going to do. So powers that were far greater than us, unfortunately, again, with the change that, that everybody was living through, it afforded us that amount of time to keep working on the record and the mixes, you know, so that when the album came out on April 21st, 2021, um, we felt really good about the record that we were releasing to use in music business term. One of the things I've heard, and obviously Wasserman has acquired a number of companies over the years to, to, to be the company that is today, is that the company that acquires, it's not just about the financial opportunity. It, sees, it needs to be a cultural fit, right? And I, and I heard that from each of you when we were talking earlier. What is that Wasserman culture? What does that fit mean to say, this is going to work within the environment and the ecosystem that's Wasserman? Look, I think that what differentiates Wasserman from a lot of places is they celebrate individualism, um, but everybody has each other's backs, right? So uh, we like unique people um, with different approaches um, and different styles, but we want to celebrate one another and help each other. Um, I think everybody there is incredibly entrepreneurial, right, and is a self-starter and goes out. I think everybody there is caring. Uh, we make a big effort to care for our staff, to care for the industry and the communities that we impact. Um, I think that people are not afraid to talk about problems because when you put problems on the table or weaknesses, that's how you come up with solutions to fix them and improve. Um, I think a lot of places stray from that and they do not. Um, Molly, you've been there longer than anybody. What else do you think? Yeah, I think everything that you said and um when we acquire companies, it's always, it's never about the client list, whether it's a marketing agency, it's never about the brands, it's never about the roster, it's about the people. And that's, that's 
the first filter. Um, and yeah, it's all about values, right? Like, is, does, does the company operate with integrity? Um, do they have each other's back? Um, do they, are they inclusive? You know, do they feel like a family? Because that's how we talk about ourselves. We talk about ourselves as, as a family and, and we're all held accountable to act that way and, and be that way. So I think we've all experienced that, just, just the four of us, right? And the work that we do every day together. Um, but it all starts with, with culture. And, if it, and there's been a lot of companies that we've passed up because it wasn't the right fit. Yeah, and I would say strategic value as well. Like, we've grown pretty exponentially in the, in the two years. We've also said no to a lot of opportunities because it was either more of, the fa more of the same or it didn't kind of fill strategic needs or we didn't feel that the people or companies were aligned, right, on the, on the values. Um, so it's sort of, you know, that sauce where all of that stuff makes sense. Um, but they certainly are acquisitive and, and grow. <laughs> a number of things that have come in since us. So. I think the entrepreneurial piece is like is really rare in larger music companies, whether it's agencies or labels, and it's all focused about like the letters on the door as opposed to all the people in the building. And so to, the, to Lee's point, the ability to seek out entrepreneurs, but also when you get them in there, it's not so much about drilling down on this is how Wasserman does it. This is the process. It's really about leaning into that person's strengths and helping them grow, whether it's agents and neither Molly or I are agents, we have very unusual roles. Um, and the company leans into that and that's, that's really exciting for us. You know, I think when Paradigm was acquired by Wasserman, I, it turned a lot of heads. There was a lot of head scratching. What? I don't, this, well, I don't understand. But I think what people have missed or might miss is the fact that Wasserman had been involved with music for any number of years. So I'm wondering if Molly or, or Chapel, you can speak to sort of Wasserman's involvement in music prior to um, it becoming Wasserman Music. <laughs> yeah, um, we've really been involved in music since Wasserman came to be. When, when Wasserman started, uh, we were an uh, athlete representation business, and then we acquired a consulting business. And with that consulting business came a client that we had worked on um, with music. So American Express was really our first foray, foray into music. And, you know, another saying that we have at, at Wasserman is good work begets more work. And ultimately, it really wasn't about the vertical. It's about the approach to the business. It's about uh, the methodology and how we, we, we help our clients, our brand and property clients, build their strategies and execute them. So sure, there are nuances. And of course, you have to understand them um, by vertical. But it's really about the work and the foundational strategy, I think, that brands and, and properties and, and, frankly, artists care about. And so with that came more work and more music work. And when I was hired, I was really the first intentional music hire that they had brought on board. Um, the company was actually full of, like, interns that were great that, you know, <laughs> got, in, got their first job. Um, and so they hired me to really focus on music, bringing more music business into, into the house. And, you know, I spent 10 years prior to, you know, we had done a lot, there's been a lot of conversations about building out music. It just made sense. But um, obviously opportunities had to present themselves. And again, that cultural fit, I think. Um, but we've worked in music, whether it's Amex, AT&T, Duncan, Progressive, Pepsi, I mean, tons of blue chip brands that we've worked really closely with on building out their music initiatives. Um, and if you if you were on the talent side of the business or the agent or artist side of the business, you might not have known who Wasserman is. But if you work on the brand side of the business, you knew who Wasserman was within music. Uh, under the best of circumstances, you know, acquiring a company, bringing a company together, creating one family is extremely challenging, right? If everyone has the best of intentions. And yet Wasserman seems to have done this time and again with a lot of seemingly fairly disparate companies in a lot of ways. Is there, you know, you've touched on a little bit, but I'm wondering if there's like a recipe or a playbook that Casey et al., whoever, has developed to say, this is how you do it. Put the problems on the table, address it. Or <laughs> They have a good operational infrastructure from an operations team to HR to finance. And I think they've got framework that if you operate within, uh, will help, but I think that what's worked really well is that we listen to issues, 
we address them and get back to people, generally try to do it within 24 to 48 hours. It's not always yes. If it's no, it's why it's no, and here's how we can make it a yes or get back. And I think that if you make that commitment to the employees of the company and you show up and do that, you get buy-in and it works pretty well, right? Um, you know, I think, I think definitely from the operation side, um, they helped a lot and gave us that infrastructure that maybe didn't have as well before. Um, but I think it's, you know, uh, I think a lot of the people in the music department have worked incredibly hard to make it a, a great place for everyone to work. I think a big piece of it's patience. Like, I've never felt, we're two years in, I've never felt any pressure. I always call it WASP proper. Uh, but um, I've never felt from Wasserman that it was a, a get-rich-quick acquisition. Um, I've, I've felt that everything has been a real long lead. I'm still learning um, different divisions, have new conversations every week with different, whether it's sports agents or brands and properties teams. Um, so I, I think they look at things with a real long lead time, and there's never a pressure of, like, this has to work, and it has to work in the next three to six months. And I have pretty strong feelings about this one because I think the recipe or the people on this, on this stage and the people out there that came over, you know, as Wasp Music, you guys held our feet to the fire. You made us a better company in the process. You said, you know, because I was in the center of this integration. I was sort of their resource to, like, help them connect dots and answer questions and figure out this integration. And, you know, you talked about, we, we talked about insights and analytics. We talked about brands. We talked about all these things that made you guys excited to come over. And you made sure that we followed through on that. So I think the recipe is, lost, is you know, former paradigm, now lost music. Yeah, it's like, I, I was, we'd always say kind of the first year that reviewing is at a startup. Uh, but unlike most startups, we have um, decades of familiarity with one another um, to be able to work together, and, and um, we had some pretty good revenue on day one, right? A great client list and, and the ability to do that. Um, but, but certainly, I mean, there's some people that have worked together for 25 years at the company and on and on. Um, we had an incredibly strong bond um, when we all worked together at Paradigm, um, and that never really wavered. You know, when you're in it together, you're in it together, and I think that helps a lot. And that's when we did that first Zoom with Casey. And again, the, the whole concept of Zoom was new to all of us. Or actually, it was Ring Central then. And it was even, <laughs> right. um, but there were six of us on our side. We didn't know who would be on, on Casey's side. And we got on that Zoom. And it was Elena Rochelli and Elizabeth Lindsay and Casey and Jason Rainey and Mike Watts. And, and as we started talking, we said, for what you guys see, you see six people on your screen, but you're talking to 134 of us. And what was, and, and Casey got it right away. And then he said, then I'm speaking to 134 people. We said, whatever conversation we have, wherever this goes, how it evolves, we're, on, we're only in for the whole group. And I think to the point of, of culture and words which are pretty overused, but, but they mean a lot. The fabric of the music division, which is why Casey was so knowledgeable, was that n none of it was stamped out of some corporate training something. Like, the, it's Monterey Peninsula artists, Little Big Man Booking, you know, the, the world of the Windish Agency, uh, AM Only. And, and, and Casey recognized that, and the company not just recognizes that, it supports it. And what we have now that we never had is an element of operational and organizational structure and sound business thinking, and, and again, operations, that is, I've been around the block. It's second to anything I've ever worked at, at any, any company. It's truly an extraordinary place. And again, we're just at the beginning stages of it. And by design, we didn't want it to be fully baked on April 21st, 2021. We didn't intend it to be. What it needed to do was to, to give us a, a safe place to go reimagine the future, to think about that 22nd century talent agency now and what this unique marriage of sports, music, and branding looks like. But again, doing it in a way where the world was going to be changing. We knew it. And also, when we rolled and we announced it, we did it the way we do 
everything. It was very low key. It didn't feel like a time for, to ce for celebration for us because there was a lot of people hurting, a lot of people out of work, a lot of turmoil and, and, and loss in this country and in our business and in our case, our company. A lot of people, there was 200 and whatever names that, you know, didn't have a job on March 20th. And when, when, when Wasserman Music launched, we didn't feel like it was appropriate on any level to whether it was through press releases or announcements or interviews, of which Casey did none for a year. It was, it was at ILMC last year that he did the keynote, and I think that was his first real something. But um, it just felt like to us, like we're not the story. The story is, is gonna tell itself in the months and years to come. And, and by keeping the band together, which we did, which was miraculous in its own way, then then as time and, and, and healing takes place, also does the continued evolution of this, of this new entity with folks who have worked together for a long time, but now doing it for the first time. You know, to, to some of the points that you guys just made about it, it not being fully baked, when Molly, when you and Lee were talking about the insights and the analytics of what it could look like when you were brought together, obviously that doesn't happen day one, but the exciting part and the unique nature of Wasserman is all it is its multifaceted nature. Can you guys talk a little bit about that, how those different departments and verticals work cross-functionally and maybe an example or two of, of some early successes? I know, again, it's early days, but kind of where you're, where you're pointing towards. Here's what I would say sort of on the music side. Um, we restructured the entire business, right? Um, with a Wait, goal. Sorry, you said you restructured it? Yeah, our entire meaning, music department. Meaning what? we reorganized the way the entire thing was set up, right? From where it used to be a paradigm to, to where it is. Um, with a goal of really being one department that worked together, but we verticalized the business really by genre, right? With the thought process being that all of these different cultural ecosystems are going to look at Wasserman with a different lens, right? So a large hip hop act is going to look at the company in a different way with different needs than a jam manager, which might be vastly different than a techno manager, right? And on and on. The idea being that if we are authentic um, culturally in each of those ecosystems and we are able to build our company to be the best at serving them in each of those areas and everyone sort of like mowed their lawn and trimmed their hedges, we'd have the nicest street in the neighborhood, right? So... In doing that, um, we've expanded beyond sort of like five, six, seven people that run the company. We've brought a lot of people into those leadership roles that work to strategize within each one of those sort of verticals. Um, and you go out and you sort of set goals and understand what you're doing for the area and what you want to accomplish, right? Within each one of those, you understand what levers you need to pull across the business, right? There are certain people that need to tap more into brand partnerships. There are certain genres of people that are going to look for more sports opportunities. Uh, there are certain artists at certain levels or in certain genres that are going to need more insights on what their artist audience might be, right? There are certain people that are going to need to bring Casey in more on things or bring Molly in on things and all of those pieces, and what we're able to do is really get snapshots um, early on with, with what's going on in each one of those worlds, right? So here's our sort of 20, 30 marquee acts in this genre. Here are the 15 that are on cycle. Here are the six that are absolutely going to blow up, right? So if you look a year ago, we were able to go to the brands and property side or anybody else out, outside across the business and say, Fred again, wet lag, and baby came are absolutely going to be massive, right? Can't fucking miss. Pay attention now. When you're able to do that, right, and understand it and share and give that early access or that early information, um, it builds great confidence in what we do and know um, and continues to build our track record. Um, so I think like every one of those sort of verticals or worlds would, would give you a different answer as to how you work that, but I think we found the right ways to take advantage of everything that Wasserman has to offer in each one of those, those spots. Yeah, I mean, I think the responsibility, I mean, sure, there's tons of meetings and opportunities and structure to talk and share what's happening in the artist world or what's happening with our brands, but it's, it's somewhat incumbent on all of us to be able to pick our heads up and think strategically and connect dots and raise your hand and, and find the right people. I mean, the resources are there, um, and I think you guys have done a really 
incredible job at it. Like I said, I think we're a better company because of it. Thanks. We appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> but, I mean, tangible examples, right? I, I think it's always beneficial to hear. Like Jack Harlow, you guys were able to bring, obviously was, was ascending, was, was getting bigger, but you were able to activate him on college campuses in a way that another agency would not have been able to because of Wasp Next Gen, formerly Riddle and Bloom. Yep. Can you talk about that? We also... You want to talk about it? I want you to take that, but I would also say beyond that, you know, Aaron Pincus and Calendar didn't know how to go do a sneaker deal, right? But the basketball agents did. And they were able to teach them, you know, and through that process, you know, Aaron Pincus and, and Calendar actually negotiated, you know, with Anthony Anastasio, Jack's new sneaker deal, <laughs> which is coming out. And, you know, that was there. But, yeah, you should talk to the Gen Z stuff. Yeah, on the so there was an agency that was acquired by Wasman, formerly Riddle and Bloom, that focuses focused primarily on Gen Z marketing. Um, they have since been rebranded as Was Next Gen. So when Jack came out with his 2022 record, Come Home, The Kids Miss You, um, they were the, we actually engaged, our agency team engaged the label, and was like, how can we bring this from an experiential standpoint on campuses? Um, Next Gen has relationships in like 1,200 colleges across the country, and they have actual brand ambassadors in all of those colleges. So deploying that, which would have been pretty daunting otherwise, was actually pretty seamless. So across colleges all across the country, they put up uh, nail techs or like uh, brought in manicure, manicure artists to do nail techs or to uh, like manicures. And focused That's, on the single. I didn't, I've never heard that term before. Yeah. That's an official term in nail tech. And nail tech. Okay, nice. it is. You want to go uh, for a patty and a mani after this? So they deployed. They deployed. Uh, I guess manicure artists or nail techs across the country to to promote um, the single that was coming out. And they were on campuses for like six weeks, and that drove you know engagement in a in a core demographic for Jack. And you know, cre the, the big piece is not only just the person to person engagement, but the the social extension from that. I mean, you have a pretty unique role within the company. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe some of your, your recent sort of work with whether Blake, Sheldon, or, or the, the cash estate? Sure. Um, so I focus on new business, which is a very ambiguous term, but I look at it in two ways. Um, I, I focus on creating non-touring, non-performance-based opportunities for Nashville's roster. Um, that's mostly in, in my world to Lee's point, we do, I, I live in the country and Americana vertical. Um, so sometimes that's brand partnerships. I've got a colleague who I think is here, AK, she's my partner. And so we focus on, um, she and I focus on a more traditional endorsement deals. I do a lot of product licensing. An example of that would be what we just launched. Well, what we launched last year with Blake Shelton where he's the global face of Land's End, but also he has his own collection that's like 150 items with his name. It's a co-brand between him and Lanzan. Um, and then another, another on the cash estate, pretty much everything we focus on is product licensing. Um, so we did a really exciting partnership with the MLS and Nashville Soccer Club. It's a long story, but over the course of three years, we were able to, the, the MLS team here at the Nashville Soccer Club are the boys in gold. We got them temporarily rebranded as the Boys in Black. They have a Man in Black kit that is all Johnny Cash branded uh, that launched in February, and then the merch collection will come out in uh, May of this year. So really giving them, it was a team that already was identifying with the Johnny Cash brand, so really giving them a lot of identity in the league. And through that, we've partnered with Apple, uh, Adidas, and Fanatics on deploying that nationwide. Um, and then the other side of it is is working with music leadership like JL and, and Lee on how do we grow specifically in country Americana. Um, the company has been really supportive of giving us tools to do that, whether it's looking at boutique agencies, whether it's stuff, looking at opportunities completely outside of touring and, um, and growing our footprint in, in both genres. The Johnny Cash example, just to toot Chapel's horn, it was, it was three years of work and it is the perfect nexus of sports music and branding. I mean, it, like that's it. That's in a nutshell, just one deal. But spot on. And then, and then Molly and I work together a lot. She lives in the the brands and property side as the music specialist, and then we talk.
Probably daily. Um, uh, Molly was our Sherpa. For, yeah. <laughs> shepherd, so we, the shepherd. So to Lee's point earlier, she keeps us updated on what's happening on the brand side of the Wasserman business. And then uh, I keep her updated on what's happening on the country Americana side. Yeah, I think also it's like, it's important to note, you have autonomy to do what's right for the client in all these situations. So if I have a client that really wants an AT&T deal and it's not right for the brand, it's not going to happen, right? If AT&T really wanted a client, it wasn't right for the client, it wouldn't happen. Um, but I think like the early access to information and sharing, you know, like that team being able to share with their clients what's happening with artists, who's going to be on cycle, what surprise albums are coming out before any of that hits the marketplace and vice versa, us understanding what brands are looking for before briefs get circulated all over the place definitely yields great results, you know? Yeah, I, and while we've worked in, the, in music for 20 years, we are now squarely in the center of the industry and have gotten m many more opportunities because of it and a lot more credibility because of this info and access that we're able to share on, you know, both sides. Yeah, like delivering cautious clay at NBA All-Star Weekend in Cleveland where he's from on an AT&T branded event doesn't happen if we don't work at Wasserman and there's dozens of those stories um, and it's been really great. Um, out of the gate, there was a stated goal to expand Washington music um, as the live entertainment business rebounded in 21 22. You know, you talked about exponential growth. You know, to what degree have you guys been able to achieve that? We were 134 April of 2021. We are roughly 325 today. Um, you know. 80 of those people came when we were able to finalize the deal with our former partners in London, formerly Coda and then Paradigm. Um, look, some of it, it's, it's about servicing the clients, right? So um, sometimes that's more support staff for agents. Um, and sometimes those are jobs that didn't exist or bolstering the service stuff. Um, and those are things that on a daily basis we have conversations about. Um, and that's sort of where it's come, and, you know, I don't think we're in a race to add as much headcount as we can as possible, but we are at a race to continue to service our clients at as high of a level as possible, and that leads to growth. Uh, I thought it was interesting that I heard this comment from Ben Lovett yesterday when he was asked, you know, what attribute or what was missing that you didn't hear talked about, and he talked about uh, consistency. And Casey said that one of the things that define Wasserman as a company and something that is a mantra of mine is being relentlessly consistent. He goes on to talk about this. I'm not going to read the whole quote. But talk to me about this relentless consistency. How have you seen this in a tangible way manifested in what you guys do in day out, day in, day out? Well, one is just, again, from an operational and organizational standpoint, how the companies run. It's not run and now we do have two years under our belt and we had a year plus before we got to the belt to experience it. It's not consistent uh, in one area and then it's inconsistent in another or an area where we need help or support or leadership. I mean, at the end of the day, even when we were making the deal, we're agents, we're artist representatives. You know, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I didn't go to Wharton School of Business or Harvard Business School and, and yet we were building a, you know, trying to build a business in, in, in a completely different model. And the consistency of, of the guidance we got, the leadership we got, help with budgeting, financing, structure, having every person who's in our music division, which speaks to the whole company, because it's, again, it's the same in the non-music side as it is in music. Every person, not only do they have a place, which... There, there is, there's two words that are a, a very big deal at Wasserman. It's called career path. And while everybody has ambition, the, the idea that the company is, is, is built to help somebody's career path, to help them navigate it, it becomes our job as, as leaders, guide, guides, mentors, tour guides, whatever, to help that person's dreams happen. And, and one of the things that is, is defines how it's set up, again, from an operational and an organizational standpoint, is not titles for the sake of, where, you know, this is me,
but more if this is where you are and you have aspirations and designs and ambitions to grow, how can we help and what, what's needed, what's expected to help get there? And some of that is, is certainly based on tenure or time or where you're at, but then there are the non-quantifiable things, and that's what I really love about Wasserman, which is really tapping into that, that, that aspect of, of the human culture that is us and that defines us of something that isn't in a spreadsheet. It isn't in your year-end number. It's based on who the person is and how we can help them. It's, it's you know, artist development and, and employee development, if, if I may use that term, they're the same thing. And the, the idea of being relentless, it, it's the same with our gig. We, I mean, if we're, if we're relentless one year and we're coasting the next year, we're probably not going to be in business with that artist that year. And, and it, 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 it's about the consistency, and there are always the variables that we have no control over, whether it's, it's you know, trends, fads, whatever. But, but the, the approach is the same, always. And from, from how we look at artist representation and artist development is the exact same way we look at the folks who work with us. And everybody has an idea of, of and knows where they are and, and, and what the next steps are, and it becomes us holistically. It's our responsibility to help them get there, not just leaders, everybody on a team. Uh, this past November, Providence Equity Partners made a significant investment in the company. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you see that investment being put to work or what, what the goals are for that investment? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there were uh, two private equity partners that were in there. Um, they recapitalized and Providence came in. Um, I think it's a testament to their confidence in us. Um, you know, Casey owns the majority of the business, so uh, we don't make decisions based off of um, spreadsheets or valuations or profitability. Every decision that we make is based off what's the right decision for each client. Um, Certainly somebody like Providence who makes large investment isn't doing it to break even. So <laughs> obviously they believe that we're going to grow as well. Um, and it's great to have, um, you know, a war chest of capital, people that want to help us grow our business in the right way and do it. Kind of that simple. Um, this is to, to all of you, right? Obviously you guys, each of you have different remits and mandates. Um, you know, what sort of headwinds do you guys find yourself facing? Whether that's newer challenges that you're addressing the last couple of years, um, industry as a whole, company as a whole, what are some of the challenges that, um, you know, you guys, uh, again, are, are facing and trying to solve and work through and, and develop sort of, you know, a better uh, solution for or work around? Well, there's some... some some aspect of that, again, has to do with the times that we're in. I mean, I think, and, and we, we use this on those twice daily Zooms for the 15 months that we were doing them to try and get this, to guide this deal this way, um, is that everything felt to us like it was going to be different in a, on a lot of levels. Um, and, and for us, we wanted to be prepared for that and be able to grow and evolve as, as we got to this other side. The headwinds we face now, um, I mean, A, their competition is not going away. I mean, we still have to compete every day, and we compete against great companies who do great work and represent great artists and have great people that work at those great companies. So that's, I mean, we'd be foolish to think otherwise. That's a reality. You have to know who you're getting in the ring with every day. That's, that's just part of the gig. But um, so that's a headwind. And then there's just headwinds of, of change. You know, the, the one constant, this is as, as cliche as it can be, but the one constant that show business, music business has, entertainment has, is change. Things change. Yet it happens, there's, there's a cyclical nature to it. And from the standpoint of, of whether it's technology, whether it's access, whether it's research, insight, one of the things we loved in our, and especially in the early conversations on the Wasserman side, was that Wasserman, and this is a mantra that you'll hear a lot, we're living in a time where we're, we're drowning in data and we're starving for insight. I can take my phone out of my pocket and look at streams, followers, likes, views, downloads, whatever. The, the key is, what, what is what are the insights from that data? How would that allow us 
to do a better job representing our clients or our, our business or our company. And that's, that maybe isn't a headwind, but it's certainly an element of the fact that, that as change is happening, and there is no shortage of music out there. There's no shortage of talent. There's no shortage of people knocking on our doors. So how can we do a better job in the process in identifying who we want to work with? And then once we start working with them, do a better job than our great competition does in the approach of, of not just artist representation, but artist development. Yeah, I think, look, we, <clears throat> are in an industry that is predominantly white men. It's not reflective of the clients we work with or the society we work in. That's a challenge and something we want to work on. Um, bots and scalping is a challenge. Uh, the cost of touring to both promoters, artists, everybody out there is a challenge, right? So I think every day, you know, you, you've got them on your plate. Um, I think we continue to work with our partners and, and be creative to try to fix these things. Um, and we have, a, uh, uh, we have a relentless pursuit of making sure that we can fix all these things that are out there, you know. Um, and I'm sorry that we'll have a major, I'm sure that we'll have a major challenge that rears its head that we're not aware of in two days, and we'll tackle that one with the same tenacity, right? Chapel Molly, from the brand perspective, picking up a little bit of what, you know, was talked about yesterday on, on, a, brand, on a branding panel, you know, in terms of the challenges that you face with the politicalization of, you know, how, what is a brand's affiliation? What's an artist's affiliation? How do you bring them together? Is that something that you guys sort of see in your day-to-day -day or any other headwinds that you guys might be facing? Um, I don't know if I see it as a headwind on that. I, I feel like brands are smarter on average. This is a generalization because um, every brand's different and every buyer's different. Sometimes you get a brand decision maker who only cares about their kid and what their kid likes and they're going to spend seven figures to partner with that and that's their market sample. Um, but on average I think brands are getting smarter as, as to how to play in music and I think it's, it's because of agencies and honestly because people like Molly and people in house at those brands that are brought in to be specialists in music. Music is extremely fragmented as opposed to other aspects of the entertainment industry whether it's TV and film actors or athletes. Um, so to have someone to help you navigate that is a, is a huge win. Um, half, of, half of what I do when we talk to brands is educating them on, on kind of our world. So I'm seeing that become less and less, which to me is a big tailwind. Um, and I think they're starting to understand the emotional connection between fans and music and how it's really hard to replicate that as opposed to fans and sports, which tend to be regionalized. Um, so I'm actually really excited, on the brand side of the, of the world, I'm really excited about like, what the next five years look like as opposed to the last five years. I think from a, um, from a headwinds on brands, they just have so many, like you're not competing against another artist, you're competing against like the latest Netflix show and the latest, um, the latest hot athlete or you know, there's, there's a lot more to compete against, um, but that's always gonna be the case. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm in a very optimistic place as it relates to brands. Yeah, and from a headwinds perspective from where I sit with brands, I mean, I think the economy obviously is starting to play into some of the decisions we make. Selfishly, that oftentimes is a, a, a positive for Wasserman because they look to us to think about how we're gonna reevaluate and how we're gonna rethink and how we're gonna show up differently and how we're gonna deal with any sort of budget limitations. So. I'm with you, I super, you know, I feel positive about what's, what's coming up and sort of where Wasserman sits. Um, you know, we have such a diversified set of marketing services and offerings that, you know, we proved this through the pandemic that, you know, because we offer a variety of things that oftentimes if one thing is down, the other is up. Um, and so, you know, from a, from a consulting perspective specifically, I think, and in, in it's terrible to say, but for, uh, uh, an economic challenge is often a win for us because um, we'll help them think through it and, and, and figure out what to do. Uh, questions? Yes. She'll bring your microphone or you're welcome to stand like Pete does. Or you can just scream. Uh, I'm Tim Coughlin. I manage uh, Sicker Hollow. They're on the Wasserman roster. Um, you mentioned Jack Harlow earlier. I was curious what role Wasserman played in his placement on the All-Star game a few years ago. 
and if that opportunity would have been available to an artist at that stage, you know, without the uh, merger. Our brand partnerships team, um, specifically Anthony D'Astasio, um, did that deal. Um, but via Casey and our NBA team, we did have a number of conversations with the entertainment side of um, the NBA. Um, they'd actually changed their personnel and who was handling that um, the year that that happened. Um, so certainly that dialogue sort of led to it and, and put it together. Um, it's funny. I mean, we've, we've really done a lot of the Jack stuff, um, even the on-screen stuff. So we, we did the deal for White Man Can't Jump. Um, we did the deal for this most recent film where he was cast with Casey Affleck and Matt Damon. It's actually a role that Ben Affleck was going to have. Um, and one of our agents that handles on-screen stuff for the musicians and athletes got that because he found Jack an acting coach who's Ben Affleck's acting coach and stuff. So they're there. He has an incredible management team. He's an incredible artist. I think that they do a lot of hard work that sort of give us the foundation to go and deliver on some of these opportunities, but we're really proud of, of the help that we've done and the work we've done with them across all of those. Yeah, and further to that, from the brand side of the house, um, Jack was probably, I feel like when we first launched, that was like one of the first names I was being, you know, was being talked about and being, I was being told about. Got to, you know, think about Jack. And I think that All-Star Weekend when he played in the celebrity game, AT&T, me and my team also hired him to perform the AT&T pregame concert. And it was also the weekend that he launched his shoe deal. So it was a big weekend for Jack. I think Jack, you know, let's be honest, he's a star and he earned it. But I think... The, com like the, the camaraderie of Wasserman and sort of what it all brings together, I think, for sure helped it, especially yeah. that weekend. He's got a good jumper, too, so that helped him get in the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions out there? One down low on the right. Hey, Johnny Scoblianco, uh, Bauer Entertainment Marketing. Uh, in an era where so many festival lineups are rather cookie cutter, how do you guys maintain, you know, filling the voids that are needed to be filled while also ensuring that the artist packages that you're offering to festivals are going to be unique to that experience? Could we do another whole panel on festivals? <laughs> Next year. I mean, it's a vital part of the ecosystem. They make all the sense in the world for what they do. There's also a lot of reliance that's placed on them that I feel is somewhat false. Uh, there are absolutely roles and places in a festival that can help propel an artist's career. No question about it. But it's not the be-all and end-all. Um, FYF is probably the most overused three letters in any email that comes to us these days, first year festival. Uh, the key is, is hopefully there's a second year festival and a third year. But I think the, from our standpoint, uh, A, the power of no is a good one to know. And, and B, the power of being selecting is good. I'll just use one example from, this is a few years ago, but as, as, as Metamodern Sounds was breaking, Sturgill, we had 50 festival offers that particular year, and we turned down 36 of them, and of the ones we played, they were doubles. It was Coachella Stagecoach, so that was two, but it was really same thing, and it was, you know, there was a few like that, Governor's Ball and, and the country festival they did that year. I, when, we're, when you're thinking artist development, and you're thinking a long game, and what it means to build a career and not capitalize on a moment, then it's my own philosophy at least, and I think a lot of us sh probably share it, is it, just because it's there doesn't mean you do it. And you want to be strategic about it. And, and our take um, in that same window when, when he was offered the ACL Festival in, in Austin was, it, no, this was a year prior, was it, it didn't feel ready for us yet because the slot, the day, the money, the position just and we, we knew that he'd be around. We knew the festival would. So we were cool to, to let it go. I, I think with anything, it's, it's, you just have to be able to look at a festival and your placement on it and think strategically because that's what we're paid to do is not just to say yes, to ask the questions, to analyze it, to think about why you're doing it, and most importantly, what is it setting you up for next? 
What's the, what's the follow-up to it? And whether that's helping you build a city, a state, a country, a region, there has to be a purpose for it. If it's just a paycheck, I guess that's okay too, and some will take it for that. You know, ultimately, it's not our decision, right? Our, you know, it's a level playing field. Offers have to be presented. But there just needs to be thinking behind it. And, and I do think, and it's certainly something that Casey recognized, and it amazed us on that first Zoom and every conversation since, how much he understood our approach to representation was, was being very strategic and very intentional and not just saying yes because something's there. But we, we could do a deep dive on, on that. Yeah, I would add, we have a great fairs and festivals department um, that's thoughtful. Um, we have no shortage of agents who will share their opinion and tell a promoter if they think they're doing a bad job with their lineup or good. Um, we don't just submit a list of our roster. You know, we have deep, detailed strategies for all of our clients that are all different. So we sort of know when something's a target and when it isn't. Um, it's very easy to say no. And when it's something that we really plan to get, it's an important step for the artist. Um, we usually have a high batting average of getting them to say yes. Um, and I think we try to hold the, the festivals accountable, uh, you know, for being diverse and exciting as well. Um, it's a super interesting time in that space right now, of, of sort of what's working and what isn't. Um, and definitely something that, that we talk a lot about and look at day in and day out. Well, we are at time. Thank you for sharing your stories, Wasp Music and Wasserman. Uh, we appreciate it and a very early happy birthday.